Place censorship was born from from the people here in this room. Um, it, it started at the, the uh, CBX tour and just, uh, I guess, um, you know, speaking about the things that I cared about and people like Patty and Laura really encouraging me and saying like, well, like let's like let's make shit happen. Like, what are we waiting for? Um, and after after that Congress, we riled up um, like 20 or 25 of us, um, and we had a uh, what we call the Place Summit, and we uh, with the agenda of discussing climate and equity. Um, and after that, uh, Garland, you know, the the uh, the weekend event ended, and Garland said, "Well, what next?" And we're like, "Yeah, well, what 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 is next?" Um, and at, at that point, we started uh, meeting on a weekly basis, uh, you know, just kind of addressing the issues. Um, and then eventually, uh, we, you know, branded ourselves as Place Initiative. Um, yeah, and, and here we are today. What is Place Initiative? Uh, Place Initiative is a volunteer organization that operates at the intersection of climate action, urbanism, and equity. Our goal is to elevate the role of urbanism through advocacy and policy on local, regional, and national levels. We do this through publishing a series of information sheets surrounding these three key topics and initiatives to advance education and action. We strongly believe urbanism is the key solution to solving for the climate crisis and want to elevate that in national efforts and discussions around climate, and it's not yet widely acknowledged. Urbanism is at the center of multiple arenas of, act, of climate action, public health, equity, and social responsibility. All people should have access to affordable and appropriate housing, transportation freedom, parks and gathering spaces, institutions, employment, and education, all in close proximity. We must repair past harm. Removing barriers that have destroyed neighborhoods, reform exclusionary policies, provide equitable access to services and resources, and prioritize programs such as reforesting the city in areas that have been historically disinvested in. As we continue to make our communities more sustainable and resilient, past harm must not be repeated. We must systematize anti-displacement policies and programs, build local wealth, support community in entrepreneurship, and move our supportive institutions back to communities they serve. Within and across our communities, we can manifest an equitable, climate-resilient future by strengthening dem democracy, which may include ensuring systems of representation serve under resourced communities and localizing decision-making through systems of subsidiarity. Climate change will exacerbate issues of equity in, in housing and beyond. We need solutions that provide for equitable outcomes. We know we can't tackle this effort alone and are looking to establish partnerships, identify and connect with others who are making change in this space today, and amplify collective efforts to advance more rapid and meaningful change in communities everywhere. Future climate resilience cannot be achieved without urbanism, and neither can be successful without addressing fairness and equity, both past harms and future outcomes. We must begin today to plan for an equitable future, not only for those who are forced to move without financial or social capital, but also for communities that will see an influx of new residents who assets, whose assets and cultural heritage must be respected and invested in. So those are some of the things that Place Initiative is focusing on with our equity efforts. Um, and that plays into the other initiatives that uh, my colleagues here will be presenting on. See, that's on all my social media um, profiles. So um, the thing that I would modify slightly with everything that most presenters say about climate change is it not, it, we shouldn't be using the word will. It will do this. It is doing this. It has been doing this. It is getting worse and we just don't have the lens through which to accept what the reality of climate change looks like. It's asthma, okay? It's Lyme disease in places where we've never seen it before, right? It's, and people are like, hurricanes. Yeah, yeah, hurricanes. They're big, they're sexy, the media gets to look at it and see if it, will it make landfall? Won't it make landfall? Oh, it's gonna be the end of days. Oh, actually, it was just some rain. I have done so many disasters, 13 years of disasters. Why am I in disaster recovery? Because I lived through a disaster. I was a school teacher. I have an art degree. I did not get into knowing that I was gonna be doing disaster recovery. I didn't know anything about new urbanism. I am not an architect. I am not a planner. I'm a regular person that had a regular life. I like doing community organizing. I like advocating for disinvested neighborhoods and figuring out how to make them more walkable for kids. 
I like to do face painting with kids. I like to do all these things with kids. So when Alabama in 2011 was hit by 67 tornadoes in one day, and most of those 67 tornadoes happened in two hours, can you all imagine what it's like to have 63 tornadoes hit in a two hour span? The weather people had been talking about it for days. Something is going to happen, but we don't know what. Something is coming and we don't know what. But they always say that. It's always the end of the day. It's like the blizzard of the world is ending and all of the bad things. Except that day, the bad thing did happen. And nobody paid attention because we hear that it's going to be a terrible storm all the time. We didn't pay attention. That day, at the peak of the disaster, we had over a thousand people missing and unaccounted for. Because in this country, other like in other countries, we actually have no system in place to account for missing people during a massive devastating disaster. I learned that by showing up at the Red Cross headquarters, which by the way was in a brand new building that had not yet been set up. We had one phone, no computers, and it was me, a house mom, and a minister. And they were like, we were like, what do we do? And they're like, I, I took, answer the phones. We have people calling from all over the world. What do we do? What do we do? This is what climate change looks like. It looks like showing up, waking up one day, and then the entire world changing. And that's what happened for me. And so I saw that communities wanted to rebuild differently, and I saw FEMA say no over and over and over and over again. And I didn't know anything about federal policy, but I know that there's a book called The Code of Federal Regulations, and so I started reading that to understand what the hell was going on. And it turns out that the federal regulations actually would allow us to do things differently. And I learned about new urbanism through wanting to do more walkable communities. And then Nathan Norris found me at a smart growth conference where I was talking about you know, health and equity and you know, black communities and the health issues impacting the neighborhoods in Birmingham, Alabama, where I'm from. And he was like, come over to new urbanism. And I found that new urbanism had a huge overlay in the things that disasters also impacted. Because what I had seen in the tornadoes, knowing nothing about new urbanism, is that two cities were hit by the same tornado, totally devastated. One was a nice German settlement town, beautiful little town square, chapel of the church is the tallest thing in the middle of town, off the school, two blocks off the downtown square. The other community, sprawl, strip malls, no they are there, state DOT running right through the middle and it had just cropped up gas stations and nothingness. So when this tornado ripped through and tore out all the power lines and phone lines and there's no way to communicate with anyone, houses are down, the city hall is gone, the fire station is gone, all of the infrastructure and people that are supposed to be able to respond to you in the midst of a crisis. There was no way to communicate that you needed help. So what happened in the first community? They did what they always do when they need to communicate. They walked to the town square and they started getting mobilized because while the church steeple had been damaged, it wasn't destroyed. And so they were like, Mrs. Smith, go check on her. And you guys, let's start cutting. We gotta get these trucks in here. We gotta get to other people's houses. Get your uh, Southerners, we are really good at snapping to and doing what needs to be done. Get your chainsaws, let's clear, clear these roads. They were mobilizing, oh, no electricity? Your food's gonna start spoiling. Uh, Bobby, don't you have a generator? Let's go get that, let's get it gassed up. Who's got extra gas? They were mobilizing within minutes after the disaster. They were seeing who did have a vehicle that wasn't crushed. Okay, you gotta get out. Uh, Mr. Smith, he's on an oxygen. Um, we need to check on him because there's no electricity. Somebody else is on insulin. What do we do for them? They were so fast at mobilizing. The other town, there was no way to mobilize. There was no way to communicate. Three days later, I'm hanging out with Red Cross and we're getting into these communities and I'm just on a ride along trying to learn what all of this is about and trying to do what I can do as a doer. We roll in to this first town. They already had their roads cleared. They're like, we're good. Like, go help somebody that needs it. Like, we've already set up triage. We've got food. We've got everything we need. We're good. We go into the second town. There is no one doing anything. The fire chief and the mayor, they were taking care of their own family's needs because they were in crisis. There was no leadership. There was nothing because there was no there. There was no way to organize. People died, crushed under buildings because of that. All of this comes around a place initiative and new urbanism because 
I realized when I found new urbanism that it was at the epicenter of whether or not you live or die in a disaster. True resilience is about our ability to do for ourselves and each other when all of the systems have fallen apart. Climate change is at the epicenter of those systems crumbling at the edges. And that's on top of the missing middle housing crisis and we're not factoring in all the disasters taking housing off the market. And it's on top of the crumbling infrastructure that we thought we could build and never maintain. It's at the epicenter of all of that. So for place initiatives, when they are looking at the things that the government is doing, I tend to be the one that's like, I'll work with the federal government. And Andreas is like, that's fucking federal government. It'll never change. It can never get better. Katrina, Katrina, Katrina. And I'm like, that's 2,500 disasters ago. It doesn't sound like Andreas. Not at all, right? Not at all. My point is, cool. The federal government pisses me off too, but I'm a doer and I believe in doing when things piss me off. So that's why new urbanism fits in perfectly for me. So the role of the government, we, have, we all know the role of the government to create obstacles and prevent anything from happening. Unless we're the ones that come in and take over. And I am currently trying to take over FEMA because it is one of the organizations that really pisses me off. For 11 years I've been hacking the system and now I'm trying to get a presidential appointment to take over the system. Because there are people that believe in taking over at the top so that we can do better at the bottom. Recommendations of change, walkable communities. Again, this isn't a luxury. It really pisses me off having grown up poor that beauty and walkability is seen as a vanity in this country. It is disgusting. I worked for the New York City Housing Authority after Hurricane Sandy as their resilience specialist designed a $350 million solution for renovating all of their outdoor green spaces to create more equity, equitable spaces that also manage the world's largest amount of stormwater ever. Politics come into play. I got the $350 million. It was going to be from the governor. The governor didn't like the mayor. The mayor blocked it. The project was pulled because Sandy wasn't a rain event. It was a surge event. Come, come to find out. A few years later, I don't know if you guys remember three years later, three years ago, when New York had that big rain event, my stormwater management system was designed to hold an eight inch, 24 hour rain event. That's a lot of rain, eight inches. Oh, that would never happen. We don't need that much management. Do you know what that rain event was? Eight inches. The, the loss of life, the loss of property, the devastation of lives, it didn't have to happen. We knew that was gonna happen, but there wasn't designing for it. Housing, I don't know if anyone was in the session uh, yesterday with Brzezinski, um, the uh, Congressional Black Caucus of New Urbanism. Next year, make sure you highlight those sessions. You gotta get into those sessions. The decolonization of black neighborhoods was yesterday, it was phenomenal. So a lot of this is about the repairing of the mortifyingly awful things. We spent 20 minutes railing against, let's not use the word urban renewal anymore. If you have not yet deleted it from your lexicon, you really need to. You can say things like, when the federal government and state and local government systematically removed property and destroyed families and stole everything so that we could build nothing or build a mall or build something that we can be proud of 50 years later, we need to stop, start using words and looking at reparations as a reality. And for me, reparations looks like in buyout programs, paying a black family that has had a home in their family for three generations that it's now worth 10 times less than it was worth when their great grandmother bought it as a first freed slave. They're not, they're being robbed of generational wealth today. The results of redlining are happening today because that nice buyout program, they look at comparables and the comparables like $35,000 for that house. That house should be worth $3.2 million in lost wealth. My recommendation is all we do is a simple mathematical calculation of what the home would have been worth had we not stuck them in the floodplain in the first place. There's some really easy basic reparations. The Department of Treasury, looking at the way in which we allow investments to occur. I know a guy in Birmingham, Alabama wants to buy a, a, a building in his black neighborhood. He is a local, wants to develop it. The valuation on that building Zero dollars. It was fully, it had tenants. People living in it, businesses in it. Zero dollars. Why? Oh, things in that neighborhood. You know how they are. So looking at the appraised values and the way in which that affects 
your ability to live the life that you want to live to achieve it. Other action items, looking at the way in which the banks manage money, looking at carbon indexing. There is a lot of things about carbon sequestration, et cetera. Mostly what the federal government does is have really good intentions that we are physically not able to do at the ground level because of some really easy things that could be fixed. But we have to be the ones willing to roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty in a federal situation. And most people are like, I don't want the brain damage, Laura. I'm like, I got $30 million to build affordable housing, capital A, big giant A, 100% subsidized housing. It took me eight days. I put in 18 grant applications in eight days. I had no special training other than my tenacity, my stubbornness, and being just in general pissed off that rural communities don't get what they deserve, and they're the ones that we are not talking about that this kind of climate change is having a direct impact on. It's the black neighborhoods, and it's the poor rural communities. They're pissed because they deserve to be pissed, because yes, I am also tired of talking about coastal communities and sea level rise. I don't give a shit what's happening in Miami. I am so tired of hearing about cities that have plenty of money to play with. I am working in communities of 10,000 people that have two nickels to rub together. They don't have the money to fix their wastewater treatment facility that was flooded. They are not the ones directly contributing to the climate change. Texas, I'm in Texas. I just sit still and wait for another dis disaster to happen. Transportation, what do we have going on in Texas? Oil. Do you know that the governor of Texas has made it illegal for any corporation to disinvest financially in fossil fuels? You're legally not allowed to do it. So when we're talking about climate change and what's happening, we're not even paying attention to the fact that 300 communities with populations under 10,000 people were affected by Harvey. 300 communities with populations under 10,000. You know what we talk about? Houston. What's Houston got going on? I don't give a shit what's going on in Houston. I give a shit about the rest of the places that nobody is talking about. Other action items. Because pain and poverty and trauma, when you are in trauma, you are not acting with your most reasonable mind. There was a mayor that I had that I told him, you can have a new city hall that you've always wanted. You can't put back the drywall. Leave it. It has to stay this way. He was like, I get it, I want the new city hall. I said, I can get you millions of dollars. We can create a town right in the center. We can relocate you. Your city hall is flooded three times. Don't put back the drywall. I leave, I get a call from the city secretary the next morning. She said, Laura, he's over here putting back that drywall. I said, Mayor, what are you doing? I told you not to put back the drywall. He said, Laura, look, I heard you. We have, we can't leave the drywall like this. We, people, they're gonna come in here and we need to show that we're doing something. We gotta put it back and then we can do the thing that you talked about. Trauma. My dog loves me, but if he's injured and I go up to him, he's going to bite me. It's trauma. So we're not making good decisions. We're not making rational decisions. And it's one of the reasons that I advocate for young people, and I mean very young, like middle school and high schoolers, to literally take over the system because adults cannot be trusted. We think we got plenty of time. We do not. We long ago lost all that time. And it's not like in the future, that ship, that ship and that ship has passed. We are in it now. Environmental Protection Agency. After Harvey, our state Environmental Protection Agency filled with adults helped hide the amount of pollution and devastation to black neighborhoods, the amount of pollution in water, the amount of devastation to industrial petroleum plants that that water shoved into neighborhoods was devastating. And the state EPA helped hide it because it's a real bad look for the petroleum industry. Disinvesting from petroleum and doing the things with agricultural responsibility that Place Initiative is focused on, Department of the Interior, all of these things, they sound big and ethereal, but at the end of the day, they are grassroots and they matter to rural communities. And most people, we were not born in the big cities. We were born in the rural towns, right? We have family members that live in those places. Department of Energy, same thing. Texas, freeze a couple of years ago. People don't need to die when it freezes in Texas. But we did. People died. No water, no power for weeks. And that was not a rural community. That was city of Austin. 
So if the city of Austin can't get their shit together, how much chance do you think a town of 10,000 has? Department of Commerce, Small Business Administration. What I love about Place Initiative is it focuses all at the high level, it focuses at the ground level, and everything in between. So no matter what you care about, Place Initiative is a place where you too can contribute to the conversations that need to be had. If you're like, oh, we need this group involved. We need to be doing more with differently abled people. We are limited to who we are because we are the ones that are already at the table. We need you all to come to the table and bring with you the people that you see are missing. Bring with you the organizations that are missing. Bring, I saw a FEMA person in the room for the first time in 13 years at CNU yesterday. First time. And I had everybody applaud him. And I said, please, baby Jesus, will you please come back next year and bring some of your friends? Department of Transportation, will you please bring your friends? They need to know what we're doing in new urbanism, but this is like the most ineffective cult I have ever seen. We need to do better with the messaging. We need to do better with the branding. Camille has given us an opportunity. Camille did not come into this with 50 years of experience and I'm older than everyone and I know everything. No, she came in with a vision and a lot of energy and a lot of positivity and believing that we could all come together and make better things happen, but not if we're the only ones in there. I will let them take over. I appreciate you listening to me rant and rail and I hope to see you at the next Place Initiative meeting. How this really works. I look at this and I kind of start to see it's almost like the Rust Belt. You know, this is the mapping of the Rust Belt of, of a location in our country where we have cities that used to have 1,800,000 people that now have, if they were down to 600 and they're really glad they're up to 800. That's a million people of capacity that had the infrastructure in place at one point. Much of that inf infrastructure is still there. So I think a tremendous amount of this opportunity is not only to accommodate the needs that we have for. Um, displaced people, but also to revitalize those places that existed very well for a real, very long time. And in the process, if you picture what's happening, you know, Mr. Widget loses his factory outside of Houston. And because it's on the wrong side of the velocity zone, he can't rebuild it because it's more than 50% damage. So what does Mr. Widget do? I mean, it's pretty hard to recover if your factory's been taken away from you, including the thousand people who work for him. But luckily, he went to prep school with a guy who happens to be the mayor of uh, Detroit. And the mayor of Detroit calls him up and says, you know, how are you doing? He says, not great. You know, I lost my factory. He goes, well, we have factories. Would you like to come and take one? We'll give you a factory. We'll give you a low interest loan so you can rebuild that factory to re return to making the widgets that we all depend upon every day. And 600 of the people we work with them agree because they've lost their homes to go with them too. So they end up going, they're about to make this decision to go to Detroit and get you know, revitalized Detroit, but there's a guy in the mayor's office, that like the mayor, he calls his friend, who's the mayor of Cleveland. Cleveland's willing to throw in moving costs. So we, what we need is that kind of an opportunity that people are solving their local problems by bringing people to them, because people are the resource, and places where you can survive. It's going on, everything we've talked about before here is really policy-oriented, how we change the system, but what we also need to do is provide some basis for understanding, when things start falling apart, we need to move 89 million people within a short period of time. Where should they be moving to? And it's one thing to try and convince places to move. It's another thing to have other places prepared to receive them. And that's a big part of this. Um, the, the group of uh, place initiatives that put together, is putting this thing together for the hundred receiver places has put together the equivalent of a pattern language um, for the principles on how to do it. Systems designed for resilience can survive the stresses of climate change and thrive for success that can threaten that can fragile systems. Let us build more places where people thrive. <laughs> Connect with Place Initiative so we can work together. Visit us at <laughs> placeinitiative.org. And I'm going to turn it over to Garland because he actually knows what he's talking about. Thanks. There's probably very few places in this country that aren't in some form of a housing crisis or another. Uh, and the solutions to the house, housing crisis aren't always articulated or implemented in a way that is intended to produce equitable outcomes. Uh, and so let's talk about what that might mean. 
uh, you know, especially those uh, who are most impacted by the housing crisis are, are those uh, who may be lower middle class, lower income, people of color, or other people with an economic disadvantage. Uh, so, you know, we need more uh, middle housing. Um, we need uh, we need to legalize middle housing uh, across America, where it's it's currently Ill illegal. Um, that's that's a good start, and we've heard from that in a number of sessions throughout this Congress and previous Congresses. So our CNU members are out there across the country engaging in trench warfare to try and legalize duplexes and ADUs. Right? Um, are, are there things that uh, that can be done to do that faster? Well, yes. The West Coast is kind of showing us the way um, with state mandates to legalize missing uh, middle housing. Uh, in various ways. Um, community design standards are one way to uh, empower people to have control over their own communities by saying, okay, you just upzoned my, my community by state fiat, um, but maybe I get to have a say in what the look and feel of that community is. Maybe me and my neighbors can get together and write some community design standards so that the homes that come out of the ground as a result of this state fiat are ones that we can love and we can see ourselves living in or children living in and, and we can like it and looking at those places that um, uh, will likely die, regardless of our efforts, because they're in a floodplain, or they're gonna get burned out by fire, or those places are gonna thrive without the, the investment of limited resources. They've got plenty of money, they can, they can pay to adapt. Um, or those places where survival is likely if we provide the appropriate support to, um, you know, to adapt. Uh, and then there's also type zero, Paradise, California, places that are already gone. Supportives and land trusts that allow people to um, gain and retain ownership of, of their housing assets. And also just legalize things like home sharing that can uh, allow for more people to, um, to share the cost and the burden of housing and, and live together in community and help, uh, help to also, by the way, combat the loneliness epidemic that the Surgeon General has, has identified. When you have a community land trust, uh, and, you, and you put a housing cooperative on it, that, uh, that gives you a limited equity cooperative. Uh, so I'm gonna just pause here for a sec because I, I started talking about cooperatives yesterday and someone said, what do you mean cooperative? So let's just back up basics. A housing cooperative is when you have a company uh, that owns the land. That company is the cooperative and owns the apartment building, say. Uh, and then if you want to uh, move into that apartment building, what you do is you actually purchase a share of that company. And the share in that company entitles you to live in one of the units, in one of the homes in that, in that apartment building. That's what a housing cooperative is. As it opposed to uh, a condominium um, where you're making little legal rectangles around each one of those apartments, platting them with the county assessor and selling each one of those legal rectangles. So it's just a different way to provide for um, owning multifamily housing. Uh, you can also have cooperatives for trailer parks and, and other, other ways to provide for multiple people living on the same parcel of land. It's not really cool to discriminate against visitors and say we want them over there and the homeowners are over here. Um, that is a form of discrimination. It's not enough to just think about housing. Uh, if we just wanted to solve the housing crisis, you know, there's, there's a template that could be used and it's what happened after World War II. You just go out there and you bulldoze the natural landscape and you put in a bunch of uh, subdivisions and boom, you solve the housing crisis, right? There's cheap housing, anyone can afford it, right? Uh, the problem is that, uh, well, CNU was found to talk about the problem that results from that, right? So I don't think I, I need to tell you the problem statement about the sprawl. But the solution is we need to be thinking about housing as a part of an integrated planning approach. It's also uh, looking at the economics of local communities, looking at the health outcomes of development patterns, looking at how do we plan for less traffic by not forcing people into cars for every trip. Uh, how can we plan for housing that's a part of an integrated strategy to reduce water and energy use, improve air quality, and preserve those natural working lands. You know, if we pave over all the farms so we can solve the housing crisis, what are we going to eat? Yeah. What are ways that we can um, get regulations out of the way to keep people in their existing homes when a neighborhood gets revitalized so that they can share and enjoy the wealth uh, that comes from revitalization. A lot of TOD is just for uh, middle and high income households, right? Uh, or it's for subsidized affordable, but can we provide for TOD that has housing options for people at every rung uh, of the economic ladder and also provides for, uh, for people to start up a, a small business there and it's not just the national chains that are populating the we need to be thinking about accessory commercial units and other ways to provide 
uh, for the first rungs on the economic ladder so people can start a business in a space that they can afford to operate a startup business in and then grow it from there. Um, when you hold a hard hat up to your ear and you listen really closely, you can hear the ocean. <laughs> a lot of my tree hugging friends back in that time like immediately decamped to live in the forest. Um, that's what they considered to be environmentalism. And I was always like, that's not environmentalism. <laughs> like, you're, you're driving, you're car dependent, um, you're cutting down trees to live in the trees. So um, for me, like, like basically urbanism has always been the stronger form of climate action. Not that there's a one size fits all, but I believe in that strongly. So when we talk about urbanism and climate, we are talking about not just the built environment, but also the natural ecosystems um, that the cities are sitting on um, and the communities that are built on those, um, on those places. Dense, and this is, I mean, everyone in the room knows this stuff, dense walkable neighborhoods that are transit oriented reduce the need to drive. And that, that, that clearly is a matter. Um, 2030 is approaching rapidly, and we know electric vehicles just aren't gonna get us there. So we really need some urbanism as part of the solution. So creating places that are not auto-oriented sprawl is a key factor in reducing greenhouse gases, as we've said, and they have numerous well-known co-benefits that we talk about all the time in new urbanism. Walkable places create opportunities for healthier, more active lifestyles. They create opportunities for community and connection. They are economic engines with the power of agglomeration, creating economic clusters that drive innovation and growth. Um, so avoiding auto-centric sprawl is also the key to preserving agricultural lands and natural areas. Nature bathing, a lot of doctors are prescribing that now for people for their mental health. We need those places to, to continue to exist. We can't pave them over. Um, our natural lands are also important ecosystems that protect human settlements from climate impacts and they protect habitats of species, flora and fauna. Um, adaptations in urban areas are the key to a livable planet where people are not just fleeing from one disaster to another, like Laura was describing. We need to make sure our urban areas are resilient. Question in a similar vein as the, the IRA Act, uh, the IRA question, but I, mean, I recently learned about the existence of um, advanced research project agencies, like they are like ARPAs. And I'm wondering, is this initiative something that could join in a movement to create a, an ARPA-urbanism? Would you like to lead that effort? Yes. <laughs> then the answer is yes, we can. All right. Woo! All right, everyone. We pay them to know this. <laughs> what else? Go and look at the documents. If you're like me, you're like, um, this is wrong. Yeah, this data needs to be different. This map is like out of date. I can't believe that they didn't use this other map that I totally know about. These people are stupid. They don't have any of the good stuff in here. Perfect. It's not a done document. You know why? Because we are not all of the smartest people. And we are a very small group that started very recently using all of the information that we have. And if you have better information and you have a way that you would like to improve it, Great, we look forward to you working with us to make those improvements. Yep. So the opportunity to not only provide places that can accommodate the displaced, but concurrently to use that energy to create better places, to heal the hole in existing places that will survive, and in the course of that reboot of the United States from top to bottom, finally to be able to integrate the fundamental differences that can change our 400 years of social injustice. Like, what do we, do we prepare for 2050, maybe 2035? Guys, this is happening right now. 1,000 people a day being transported by bus from Texas to New York City. And, what, and they're, well, we're going to put them in hotels. It's like it's, it, there's no system for this work, and we have not figured that out yet. We've been talking about climate displacement. My name is Elsie Clemens. I work in federal policy. I'm a disaster recovery policy expert. I help um, small municipal governments and private nonprofits fight FEMA to hold them accountable to um, providing the assistance that they're supposed to be providing. Because while what you know about FEMA is that they do housing really poorly, that is only 10% of what they do poorly. Um, the other 90% is affecting the financial ability for um, municipal governments and private nonprofits to actually recover from their disasters. So when she was talking about, you know, we need to be talking about climate change 
and social justice issues. And, you know, in the spirit of CMU, we were like, then you should do that. And so the next couple of years was Camille organizing, like, how would this be structured? She called together a convening, which um, during COVID, uh, I guess there were, we did a weekend sort of retreat via online um, that was maybe 20 people working over the weekend to just talk through from different perspectives um, what it looks like for CNU to not just be talking about um, the adaptation versus the mitigation conversation, which a lot of people talk about being so played out. I personally have zero interest in talking about like carbon sequestration because I work in the reality of disasters where people's lives are being destroyed every day. And if we're talking about climate change, it's something ethereal that happens to somebody else somewhere else. So for me, climate change is the act of natural disasters. So with Camille setting up the place initiative, what I respect about it is that it's not just a group that gets around to like talk about things, that there's actions and product and content that's coming out of it. So one of the things that we hope that happens here is that you all will feel inspired enough to provide your time in the evenings to meet. We meet, um, there are a number of working committees that produce content about social media and brand and how we do these. We partner with a lot of organizations um, like uh, through the United Nations, we've had a number of convenings that involve bringing together people in Washington, D.C. related to federal policy. A lot of um, my work is both at the grassroots level on the ground and at the federal policy level. So while I educate people on how to hack the system that they're in because it sucks and it's broken, I'm also simultaneously working to change the broken system. So I don't believe that you have to like choose one or the other, you're doing both simultaneously. And Place Initiative is a really comfortable place where that all comes together. So we have a number of people that are in the working groups but always desperately need more new people to come in to contribute to the working groups because it's exhausting to be the only one that's showing up every week like doing the work. The content that has been created that I have a, uh, some slides that I can go through is about the federal policy pieces, about how federal policy underneath this administration is making positive directional moves, but when you put a whole lot of money into the Department of Transportation and what's rolling out of billions of dollars ends up being wider roads, that's a problem. And so one of the opportunities that we have at new, as new urbanists is not only to be inspiring people at the grassroots levels with things like tactical urbanism and building the types of infill housing that we've been listening to so many sessions about, it's also to be at the table with the federal agencies, helping guide them and making better decisions because the money is going to, it is rolling out. That is happening. She's ready. Fantastic. Um, so the first question is for a very practical question for LC, which is um, because there are some efforts going on in North Carolina about this. Um, you were talking about getting grant money to do a whole bunch of stuff. Um, have you have you looked at the inflation? Re I'm, I'm curious what your assessment of the Inflation Reduction Act is, and if there's any stuff in there that um, you think could be helpful in, in, in efforts, in your efforts, probably the efforts of the group, and if um, if you figured out how to access some of the money, because I'm part of a group that's trying to do that, and it's, um, it's I'm relatively opaque. It's doable, but it's, it's, it's also going to take some work. So I was just curious about that. Yeah, so um, not specific to the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, I have been so covered up with so much work with, in, the, in the arena where there is a dis disgusting amount of money, which is disaster recovery, hazard mitigation. The, so the money that rolls out annually, not just with a disaster, but annually. Um, so I am focused on that. But what I can tell you that all, pretty much all of the federal money, it all rolls out through the states. There are very few programs that are available for somebody to go directly to the feds. And so unfortunately, that creates a barrier that alone with the fact that you have a funnel through which all things are supposed to flow so the, the state gets to create their priorities so the feds say here's the money and the state saying our priorities are old and timey priorities of the olden day you know wider streets blah 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 so again we have to be willing to some i met with somebody yesterday that um they passed legislation in their town in the, they adopted legislation to make up to six plexes single family housing with no sprinkler requirements. That's amazing. The state stepped in and reversed it and said, no, no, you can't do that. So there's one person at the state that they have to swing over. So I met with them about strategies of which, 
how to do a deep dive on that person, how to send somebody in like off research, and then you get information, and you figure out like where their kids play softball, and then you send somebody in that looks just like them, you know, like physically just like them, to have the conversation about your project that you say anecdotally, like, oh yeah, sorry I was late, I had to pick my kids up from softball. And they're like, oh, this field, that's where my kids play. And all of a sudden, then you got a friend and an ally. So I would say, you're, we're going to have to engage the state, not in an adversarial way, but in a like, my kids play softball with your kids, and hey, what's going on with that money? So like, that's the only way that money rolls out to the actual human beings at the bottom. Next question. Come on, you got and, and when you have, for example, a large natural disaster, uh, that can trigger a lot of migrants quickly. Uh, I guess my question is, what do you see over time the more likely character of climate migration? Surges, crises, or this more Charlotte steady pace? I think it's going to be like going bankrupt. It happens really, really slowly until all of a sudden it happens. Um, and then it's catastrophic and a scale that can't be dealt with. Um, I mean, you and I have talked a lot about New York and the opportunities for that. I, I think we're going to have situations where we're, we really are talking about housing a million people within 30 days and permanently. The, the, the FEMA is going to say, you know what, Charleston was a lovely peninsula, really great, except nobody can live there anymore. They're already, their, their grade level is at sea level. So, and, and the, they spent $700,000 raising up one historic structure. That that's not, we're, that kind of stuff is not sustainable. We don't have the money for that. We don't have the resources for that. Channel uh, the uh, Pearl Harbor movie where they're totally unprepared for what's happened and the nurse just turns out, you know, what do we do, what do we do? Take your lipstick, mark on their foreheads. Keep this one, that one goes. And that's what, we have to be that brutal with it and otherwise we won't survive. And I completely disagree with him. <laughs> Um, because humans are very resilient. We're like, oh, I've talked to people standing in water and they're after Sandy, and they're like, the good thing is this will never happen again. And I'm like, you're still standing in two feet of water. And they're like, yeah, but it won't happen again. This was a fluke. Like humans are so resilient in their brains to like imagine the bad thing was like, like I don't, it was, that was last week. I don't even, I don't even barely remember that thing. So I don't agree that like we're gonna have this like moment of clarity where we're like, and we're out. Oh, I don't think we're gonna get there. So for what I'm seeing is it's yes, Larry. I mean, yes, there's never gonna be it's this thing or it's this thing. It's not future, it's now. It is what's happening in New York. It is surges, it's, that is what happens. It is a Katrina 2500 disasters ago or a Harvey. You know, it's, there are big events. By the way, paradise does still exist. Like I take major, offense to that because the people in paradise believe that they completely still exist. The kids at the high school, they still exist. And if you haven't watched Rebuilding Paradise, you need to. It is absolutely phenomenal and one of the things that I'm trying to do is work with, like that's on my to-do list, is get the continuation of that with Ron Howard because he's the only one that has begun to scratch the surface of how broken the system is and why the communities are way worse off after a disaster than the disaster actually happened, but it's both. So the, the trickling has already happened. The key is what place, what my desire within Place Initiative is, and what we keep talking about is, it doesn't matter where they're coming from. Right now there's nowhere planning for where they're going. Right. Except for this town, which I was shocked to hear. I was like, hey, awesome. Like they're already doing all the things. You're just planning for growth, and then it's about a marketing strategy for who you're raising your hands, saying like, we'll take you. You don't have to go into a long-term lease. Because we know that you're planning on going back to wherever your home is. Find the way most of them do not go back, but you cannot tell them that. So you say, we'll give you a month to month. We'll get your kids enrolled in school because you don't have your paperwork because your home is flooded or it all burned down. You own a business. We'll, get, we'll make it easy for you to pop that business back up because we know that you cannot afford to be not working for more than 30 days. If, you're, if you need a job, we've got employers looking that can take you and transition you right in. We've got... Um, emotional health support. We've got an adopt a dog program so that you can love on a dog that's also been displaced by a disaster or shipped out of Texas because we have too many of them. Like, there are all these little things that you can do and what's gonna happen is people from other places are like, I want a small incubator program that makes it easy for me to start a business. I'm not displaced by a disaster, can I come too? So it's just about the marketing to a demographic that right now no one is talking about, which is the people that today need somewhere to go and then the people that have the luxury of choosing 
will also be along for the ride as well. So that's PI in a nutshell. Um, and if you're interested to learn um, more in depth of our initiatives outside of what everyone here is talking about, you can visit us at placeinitiatives.org uh, to do a deep dive. Thank you for did. coming. Sign up for Place Initiative. Woo!